Hello and welcome to the Choose Strong podcast. I am here with Sally McRae, and my name is Ed. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone that is just now tuning in for the first time, and uh, if you didn't guess by the title of our podcast in the description, <laughs> we are Eddie and Sally. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Ed and Sal. <laughs> Speaking of... <laughs> Ed and Sal. Ed and Sal went to the gym today. That's right, together. we did. Yes, we did. And uh, I, I took a picture yesterday while I was at the gym of me on the bike with my cup of coffee inside of the cup holder. Mm -hmm. And then I took a picture of the bike next to me mm -hmm. that was empty. And I texted Ed, join me. And he said, I will join you tomorrow. Yeah. And I did. And you did. Absolutely. Friends, we've, we've talked about this in, in the past, so this is just like our, our quick little tidbit. Um, we say over and over again that the mind is very powerful, mm. strongest muscle that you have. And many times when we are trying to stick to a training regimen or just maybe like it's, it's a habit we're trying to create, like all humans, we have moments we – either wake up in the morning or uh, in the middle of the day where we tell ourselves, I don't want to do this. I don't have the energy. That doesn't sound great. That's not anything I want to do. And we're really basing everything on like what we're feeling mm -hmm. as opposed to that goal that we really want and that we've set for ourselves. And as, as I know, Ed, you, you have some goals for yourself in the gym right now. And uh, you, you, you did get a little, a little cold these, uh, this past week. So you haven't been feeling like a hundred percent, but the past couple of days, you know, you're better. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, join me at the gym. Let's, let's get this going again. So the way this little tidbit works, my friends is if you're not feeling the motivation, if you wake up at that 5am alarm and you're like, there is no way I am going running right now. Don't tell yourself you're going running. Tell yourself that you're going to go get coffee or tea or what have you, whatever, you know, whatever your drink of choice is. But for uh, Eddie and I, we like coffee. So um, you put on your gym shoes, put on your, your gym clothes, and uh, you either go and get coffee, you make your cup of coffee, and you walk into the gym with that cup of coffee, and you sit on a bike, mm. and you just start pedaling. Easy pace. I mean, we're not even, because we're not working out. Our brain thinks we're just having coffee. Yeah. We've told our brain we're going to go chill. And so maybe you uh, turn on some music or a podcast. You might check the ESPN mm. app on your phone and look at the sports scores. You know, you're, you're hanging out. You're pedaling along, pedaling along. Five minutes pass. You got, you know, a couple gulps of coffee in you. You noticed around you that uh, the other bikes and ellipticals and treadmills are starting to fill up, to fill up. Ten minutes pass. You're still pedaling, still sipping that cup of coffee. And lo and behold, ten minutes, 15, 20 minutes have passed. You're done with your cup of coffee, and guess what? You are at the gym, and you are surrounded by people who have a similar goal as you do. They want to train. They want to exercise. They're trying to be healthier, fitter. They might have a race that they're training for. And there you are in the midst of them. And so you get off that bike, put your coffee cup away, and you make your, you make your way over to uh, maybe the open area, the turf. The turf. Do little mobility exercises, warm that body up. And you look from your left and right, and you realize I could go, and I could run on the treadmill, I could do the stair mill. Or I could walk over to the weight room and throw some weight around. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you're already there, right? And so this is, th this is basically what I, I like to encourage people to do. When you are in a slump or you're having a hard time getting out of bed, um, sometimes tricking yourself into just getting to the place where you train. It's a, it's a nice little game that you can play, but it actually works. Mm -hmm. This works. And uh, Eddie and I did it together today. In fact, here's a little picture. I said, Eddie, um, if you are watching us on YouTube, I said, Eddie, we got to get a selfie of this. So there's, this is a picture of us with our coffees and our big smiles 
and we're about to walk into the gym together. Yeah. And how did that go, Ed? It went, it went well. I, I mean, again, I'm not a morning workout guy, Mm-mm. but 7-ish, 7.30, had some coffee, spun the legs on the bike, and uh, worked up a little sweat. Mm-hmm. How and, long were we uh, on the bike for? 30 minutes. Yeah. And uh, got and a little sweat. we talked the whole time, friends. We is... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say I listened for 30 minutes. <laughs> I listened for 30 minutes, 29 minutes probably. And then he decided I'm never doing this again. <laughs> Where are my headphones? He's like, oh, you're going to do the bike? Oh, I was going to walk on the treadmill. Oh, 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 I can come. I can do the treadmill too. <laughs> um, yeah, no. And then after 30 minutes... After you got a little sweat going, you mm-hmm. yeah, you like you said, you do feel good that you feel like, hey, I can go into the gym and mm-hmm. and pump some pump some iron. Yeah, so then so. we we lifted for another 30 40 minutes yep. and That was good. Yeah, it was awesome when we I, uh when we went to go we we it was a beautiful morning, so we decided to have our uh podcast meeting. We usually like to have a little meeting before we we chat, we uh record. So we're like, let's take the podcast meeting outside. And as we were driving to the shoreline, Eddie says, gosh, man, it's so nice to know that my workout's done. Yeah, that's <laughs> the best feeling. Yeah. It really is. It is a good feeling. And you, I, you, I, and I know for you, like, you, your day is different every day with the work that you're working on, depending on meetings that you have or what your load looks like. But it, it, I, I felt like, uh, you know, when you, when you get it done right away, it's like you kind of have the rest of the day. Yeah. To do whatever. Yeah, I think the 7 a.m., 7.30 was a good number for me because I think if I tried that at 4.30, it'd be different. But um, I'm willing to try, but I think that that might be a little early. Maybe I just got to baby <clears throat> steps. So I start at 7, get on the bike, maybe next week at 6.30, you know, we'll that's see. That's not a baby step. That's a huge, like, a gi- well, 30 minutes earlier. Well, what, like, do you, like, what do I say, 6.50? No, I mean, step? I... No, I'm also like kind of teasing with you because you you already naturally get up early. I it's know. just that you'll get up sometimes at five thirty and you go and read for an hour and a half. So I don't think I don't think for you it's necessarily oh my gosh it's so early. It's the idea of jumping around Working and running and training and yeah. sweating is not attractive. Yeah, to I love I love getting up early, but it, the working out that early mm-hmm. I don't love. Yeah, I. I, I want know. to. I want to love it. Yeah, really. and but. I think a lot of people listening feel the same way. And yeah. and when we hit different seasons, it's harder. Mm. Like what? Like well, li- I kn- little like li- literal seasons. Or? Literal seasons oh, yeah. in our life, but then also at like at different ages too, mm. right? So yeah. I feel like, uh, you know, if if you're working fifty, sixty hours a week, you have four kids at home. And you have a lot of stress in your life. It, yeah. it, it is hard sometimes. Well, sometimes for those people, it's hard to sleep. It's yeah, like, exactly. One, it's hard to sleep. And so they choose to not do the early morning wake up because I have a hard time sleeping as it is. Mm-hmm. And if I can barely get four hours of, of sleep in because I'm, I'm up till midnight, you know, working and trying to catch up on things like this idea of like a long nap is just I can't I won't be able to get through the day. And I have a lot of empathy for that like I really really do understand that so I think leaning into the seasons of your life and constructing a schedule that works for your life at that time Mm -hmm. you and I have talked about this before because you know you you were always doing what you're doing right now you know there there was a season where you're a pastor that was a very different schedule than when you're an elementary school teacher yeah so you you had different time blocks of freedom Mm -hmm. And I, I think sometimes, you know, there's this hype train about the 5 a.m. success story and everything is like, get up at five, get up at four. And we eliminate a lot of people in that because there's people that start work at midnight and mm-hmm. they're off work at 8 a.m. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's some people, you, know, you think of like single parents and, you know, like they don't have access to child care and people to, to help so they can go to the gym or go on a run. Um, and then there isn't even always like the, the, the equipment at the house. Right. So I just, I think there, I always feel like, well, there's, there's a way that we, we find a way that works for us. 
And I've been in every single one of those seasons where it's like, yeah, zero money. I don't have a gym pass, but like I can do body weight exercises. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't have time because I'm, I'm working two jobs and I'm, I'm studying, but I actually like, okay, I can train from four to six in the morning. And it's just, it's, it's zeroing in on what is important to you. Uh, so your goals are important and they're personal to you and it's okay if not everyone understands them. But also, I think that before we kind of like convince ourselves that the only way is the way that these other successful people have been doing it, look at the way that, that, that works for you that is going to bring success to you. And I, that's where a lot of all of my training plans came from mm -hmm. and even when the kids were, were babies right yeah I was so frustrated that I couldn't train the same way that everyone else was training I was so frustrated I didn't have either the resources or the help and and it was very easy for me to just throw in the towel and say this is not the season I'm too busy um you know I, I don't have those opportunities mm -hmm. it's not fair and then I thought well what if I what if I just like figured out a way and it, it was like super messy, but I just kind of like pieced it together. So I like to talk about things that are real to life and maybe they don't connect with like every single person, but I don't think that we're all supposed to live like robots and do everything the same way. The reason why something works for your neighbor and doesn't work for you is because you don't live the same life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that you live side by side, you know, that your houses are 20 feet away from each other, but... I, I think that's also something that we can appreciate. So we can kind of, you know, when when we live and we live out loud and we live a real life, we're paying attention to what's going on around us, we're going to find a lot of inspiration. We're going to get a lot of good ideas. I like sharing my good ideas. I have a lot of really good ideas. You do. So. You have a ton <laughs> of ideas. But this one is just like I, you know... I'm sure there's a lot of fault in, there's a lot of fault and maybe some trainers and coaches and mind coaches would be like, you know, that, that isn't a good idea because of A, B, and C. But I think that the most important thing is that we showed up this morning, mm -hmm. no matter what it looked like, because no one was harmed. No one was left behind. Nobody was. Uh, but we, we met a goal. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I think the coffee on the bike the coffee on the bike trick, it, it, it just works. works. It, it does. It totally, I can attest. It totally works. So yep. um, holidays are coming up. Busy season is coming up. And uh, Eddie and I are raising our uh, sparkling water glasses yep. to coffee on the bike to get you out of bed. Tell, oh, your, yeah. tell your brain, we're not going to go work out. We're going to grab a cup of coffee and sit on a bike and uh, check the sports scores or, you know, check the latest fashions. I don't know. You don't even need to get on your phone, but like... Just go and like relax, have your, your meditation or prayer time or just like quiet time on the bike there. You drink your coffee, your tea, and uh, see what happens next. Yes, yes. You know what, Sal? Tell them about the amazing friend that we met this morning at the gym. Oh, my gosh. After we got off the bike. Yeah, so after we got off the bike, we made our way over to the turf. Mm -hmm. And right as we stepped onto the turf, we saw this... It was like a trainer. Yeah. And 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 they had their backs to us. Mm -hmm. So it was a trainer with her client and he was doing a single leg. No, no, he, he wasn't oh no, he, it was single leg or double leg double. squat. It yeah, was yeah, double. yeah. Um he was doing a double leg squat with the TRX bands. Mm -hmm. So you hold on so the TRX bands it's those long yellow um bands. They're they're sturdy um kind of like ropes mm -hmm. they're flat a lot of the gyms have them but it's it's a popular gym accessory gym piece of equipment and you can hold on to these things for balance there's a lot of cool exercises and routines that you can do with them uh particularly focusing on your core so you you know you you use these things to really isolate that but um this trainer was having this gentleman hold on to the TRX band, which has two handles. And he would hold on to these handles and he would drop down in a solid squat. Yeah, I mean, solid. this guy, he, he, he hit the 90 degree mark oh, yeah. with the knee angle. He had the knee angle of the 90 degree mark, which 
is not always easy for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we're a little bit up higher because if we go to the 90 degree, it hurts the knees or whatever. So the reason why this gentleman immediately caught our eye is because not only was he doing it so well and with ease, and he was also well dressed, mm -hmm. but he is 83 years old. Yeah, well, what caught my eye when I saw him doing it from behind, I said, there's no way that guy is under 70. So yeah. I pegged him at like 70-ish, yeah. right? Yeah. And then we started looking and how great yeah. he was looking, you know, in his squats. And then you went over to him. Oh, yeah, I went right straight up. Straight up like, to Th him. This man needs to know <laughs> that he is an inspiration. Because Eddie and I, even before we walked over, I said, I want to be doing that. Yeah. When I am that age. You know what's so funny is we were on the bike. Uh -huh. And I had told you um, about that that goal, that idea of I want to train and be so strong that my kids don't have to take care oh, of me. Oh, yeah. I go, I love that goal. Mm -hmm. You know? Like that that goal of like I, you know, I, I have an able, an able body that can – run and lift right now and how cool if i could continue training it in such a way that um i could be strong until until all my days are done yeah. you know so anyway so then we hopped off the bike right after that conversation and we see this gentleman there just so strong and and sturdy and, he, and his stature it, it's not like this guy had like bulging muscles or no. anything i mean he was probably like like 5'11", mm -hmm. six feet tall maybe, and like 150, 160 pounds. Mm -hmm. He was he had a slim, like a, a slim uh, frame. Yeah. And, but he had good coordination and balance, and he was sturdy. And yeah, when you said how yeah. old are you, and he said eighty three, I was blown away. I was blown away. I was not ready for that. And uh, his trainer just looked so proud. <laughs> She's like, right? Yeah. She's like, I literally was just telling him like how amazing he is. I'm yeah. like, I go, honestly, you are, you're, you're a light to, mm -hmm. to everyone because this is, this is what we want. This is what we long for. And you are dispelling the myth that just because you hit a certain decade in your life that you can't continue to train your body. I go, and I think I had said at one point, I go, isn't it amazing that we can always work on strength. Yeah. Like that's actually something I know it's always breaking down. We're always breaking down our bodies. And as soon as we hit 30, you know, we start to lose that muscle mass, but you can always be building it. You know, it takes a little bit longer to build it. It's a little bit harder work. And, you know, we've become more tired and um, worn down the older we get, but it's like, but you can still keep building strength. Yeah. Well, it was really impressive too, or I mean, obviously not, not only was he squatting, that was amazing. And then he told us he was 83. But then he's like, yeah, I still work. And I go up and down a ladder. Yes. I'm like, what? That is yeah. impressive. Yeah. He that said was so he cool. was an electrician. Yeah. Yeah. And and he's like, I, you know, I, I do this so that I can move well on the ladder. And I was like, Pretty awesome. I don't like getting up on a ladder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Props to him. That was, that was cool to And his witness. name? His name was Jim. His name was Jim. So Eddie and I went over there. We made a friend. Good old Jim. Uh, you know, Jim at the gym. I did. He was very gracious. I was like, I, 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 it was like such a gamble too. Like that, that's like the manners that you're taught when you're a little kid is like, you don't ask people that are older than you how old they are. But here's the one thing though. Like I just, I, I wanted to use that as a way to like encourage him. So yeah. I was like, this could go really wrong. Yeah. Right. Also it was a guy. <laughs> What if you would have asked fact, like, hey. like, 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 I feel like women are more like uh, sensitive to that than men are. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe not. But um, he was proud of it. He's he like, was. I'm, I'm 83. Yeah. And I still work. Yep. Yep. And that's why I'm doing this. And I was like, well, you are a massive inspiration. And I hope that I am moving as well as you when I'm 83. Yeah. I know. It was, that was impressive. This episode is brought to you by Ketone IQ, a clean shot of energy with no sugar or caffeine. When you take this in the morning or before a workout, you just feel more focused and energized in a good, non-jittery way. In fact, Ketone IQ, they work with top Olympic athletes like Des Linden to Michael Andrews to Ironman world champion Sam Laidlow. They also just launched a supplement and research partnership with Team Visma 
Lisa Bike. You can save 30% off your first subscription order and receive a free six pack of Ketone IQ when you visit ketone.com backslash Sally. That's K E T O N E dot com backslash S A L L Y. All right, Sal, why don't you uh, quickly break down what we're going to be talking about in this episode? You know, we're going to share just a, a lighthearted story about um, working toward a goal mm-hmm. and failing to meet that goal and uh, all of the incredible lessons and gifts that, that actually come out of that. And this is a, a great story that... I thought I would share as a way to not only encourage like our youth listeners, but this is something that would encourage if you're a teacher, your your students, if you're a coach, um, you know, and hopefully just you know whoever you are that, that that's listening, that it would just encourage you in whatever it is that you're working toward, and uh, you know I've I've worked toward a lot of goals in my life since the time I was a little girl, and most of them. Uh, did not succeed. Like most of the goals that I've set for myself did not come to fruition, which I think is uh, a valuable lesson that I started learning early on. And this idea that it is actually in the work that you do day in and day out where you find the greatest value, Mm -hmm. where the treasure is. Because too often, I believe that we actually don't make big enough goals for ourselves. We think in our mind, this is this is probably what I'm capable of, so that's the goal that I'm going to make. This kind of is in line with the family that I came from, my demographic, like how other people perceive me, and so this goal fits all of that. And... So I like to think for every time we miss a goal or we have a failure, like there's there's something inside of that journey and in that work that we need to allow ourselves to think about, wait a minute, is is there something better down the road? So yeah, we have a uh, a, a pretty cool story about the the work that we do and um, and the and the uh, the gift in and not meeting our initial goal. All right. Well, before we get into that, we're going to allow this episode to be released on Halloween. Ooh. And because we were releasing on Halloween, I, th- I just thought, I figured you would have a full spread of the candy that we were about to pass out. <laughs> I have a Halloween napkin. You have Halloween napkins, but I don't see any candy because I was just like... But down in the... Okay, come on. I was like, I need some nerds right now. So on our island, in our kitchen, I have, you know... I have the full board. I I thought you'd bring it up. And it's like the pumpkin candle and the candy dish of like candy corn. Mm -hmm. And and we have the jack-o'-leonard napkins. And yeah, it's just, you know, all the cheesy stuff that that moms do. Oh, yeah. (laughs) What is, so what's your favorite costume that you worn Uh at at a Halloween? It could be when you were five. It could be when you were 35. Think think back. What was your favorite, like you were most proud of this costume? Mm. All right, I'll go first. Uh, I (laughs) was so excited because I was a, I think a lot of people did this, but I was a beat up soccer player. Mm. I had a black eye. I ripped my jersey and I went as a beat up soccer player. Now, I never got beat up in a soccer match. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't remember anybody ever getting beat up in a soccer match. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where I was going with that. But have you I never been cool. in a fight though on the soccer field for all the years that you played? Uh yeah, well, I have been, but I didn't like. Wait, hold on. You you've swung at somebody? No, I have not. I've been punched many, many times. Eddie, are are you just uh, like the gentle one? I'm the gentle like, one that I'm retaliate. like, hey, I instigated a ton. I'm not gonna lie, like. Really? But that's like part of the game, right? Like mm-hmm. you, you get in there and you, you ruffle some feathers, you get in their head, and then some people can't handle it, you know? And so they start swinging. They, yeah. So I, I started a lot. I never, uh, there's been fights. There have had been fights uh, on the soccer field that I pretty much started 
uh, but I never were involved in, if that makes sense. <laughs> it does. So you uh, kind of got away scot-free while your buddies are over there clubbing. Well, I had guys on my team that would just step in and, like, I don't know if they that's all they wanted to do is fight, but they stepped in and kind of stuck up for me. Maybe because yeah. I weighed, like, 18 pounds. <laughs> And I couldn't like hurt anybody. <laughs> but you but, were a little smaller when I first met you your freshman yeah. year in, in uh, college. But did your dad raise you that way? What do you mean? Did your okay? Like so not to fight. So I don't know. It just never like it never was a uh, never got put in that situation to be honest. But did your dad ever say, "Hey, if you're ever in a fight, you give him one of these <laughs> a knuckle head. sandwich"? No, I, I think yeah, I think he was like kind of like most dads. Be like, hey, you protect yourself, right? But you don't go out there and start messing with people for no reason. Uh, I think that's just a common, you know, a common thing you want to pass down to your sons, where you you don't instigate stuff. Even though I instigated on the soccer field, that's a little different because it's a it's a sport. But uh, you know, yeah, protect yourself. My dad definitely um, told me that, but I never I never really needed to do that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because yeah. I've been in a couple fights on the soccer field. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> I, I would have never guessed. <laughs> I think it was either my last game in college or or my last away game in college. Yeah, it wasn't your last game. Cal Baptist versus Biola University. Yeah. And someone took out my sister-in-law. She wasn't my sister-in-law at the time. I knew she would be. That would be my sister. But yes. And they took Becky out. And Becky is, she's gritty. Yeah. She but I is. saw tears in her eyes. And I was like, whoa, I've never like seen that before. And then I was like, yeah, she, she can handle Then some I was pain. furious. Yeah. Then the, so then it was our, what was it like? So then it was our kick, I think. And, no, then they got the ball. Okay, that, that's what it was. So f after all that, after she just got dropped yeah. and run over, they got the ball, and right as, right as the girl kicked it, it was the girl that took your sister out, I ran straight at her and even, like, think about the ball. And then I got a red card yeah, right away. You got booted. Yeah. <laughs> you got booted. <laughs> <gasps> oh, yeah, yeah that was a good story i was like becky i got you girl you got yeah yeah anyways <laughs> i for whatever reason i thought that was the coolest you know costume that i because i you know basically thought of it and i uh tore my jersey and thought it was cool to be a beat up soccer player so back to you sal think back to your favorite costume what was it um i i think my favorite costume as a kid because we i mean like you all the kids made their costumes. Yeah, I know. We it was so rare if you ever bought one, and I feel like the kids who bought costumes. I mean, they, it was like I felt like it was like the rich thing to do, but yeah. like really, like you were really rich. Yeah, back in the day. <laughs> yeah, but but I I felt like also that was just like the fun part of Halloween. Like yeah, everyone would oh, what are you gonna make and um yeah. So I I don't really re remember that well. I think I. I was like a, a a tired mom, you know, you put the rollers in your hair and you have like the robe on and the slippers and that was a really popular one. Yeah. Is like, oh, I'm a mom. And, tired and now mom. as I'm older and I look back, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> so mean. <laughs> Shout out to moms. You all look tired and you wear your robes constantly. Like just like <laughs> Shout but, out to uh, the tired moms for Halloween. Yeah. So, uh -oh. um, all right. I just wanted to, to check in to see if you had a, a good costume I story. Love, yeah. I love that. It's, uh, it's been a while since I've, I've dressed up though. I know. I'm not a costume guy. Yeah. So, well, we, my, my, my mom wasn't a big fan of Halloween. I mean, it was like us five kids and it was always us begging, like, please, we want yeah. free candy. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, we, uh, there were some years we convinced her and we were able to go out. But I do remember going to, um, like, we would go to, like, the, the carnivals at the church. Mm -hmm. You know, they would yeah. put on, like, like stuff there. But, yeah, I, I want to say most years, yeah, we, we did do the, the trick-or-treating. But it was just, like, out of all the holidays, um, not as exciting as, as uh, the other ones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. All right, let's move on. So I got a couple highlights that I want to mention. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is Pam. Uh, she in her in the Chew Strong uh, Strava group said first time in double digits in three years. So she ran ten miles and first time in three years. It was not pretty. But thank goodness for a true strong podcast that lasted north for two hours. <laughs> Eddie and Sally did make me hungry for ice cream around seven miles. And it. it's Ben and Jerry's Thick Mint for me. So, Pam, well done on the 10 miles double digits. Uh, well well done getting that, uh, getting that done. And she got the Thick Mint ice cream is her favorite. Two things on that, Pam. One, Thick Mint. I need to try that because I've never had that. I, I love mints. Mm -hmm. I like junior mints. Thin mints. I like thin mints. I like the Andes mints. Yep. Mitten chip ice cream. Yep. Deliciousness. Uh, but Pam, to hit ten miles after three years. Yeah. Uh, that's a big accomplishment. That's yep. some you gotta get you gotta put in some work to get to that to the double digits. Um there is no requirement of how we need to look, what the pace is. Nope. Uh Walking ten miles is no joke. Yep. So, um, well done. Yep. We are we are very proud of you. Thanks for sharing that with us too. It's uh, it's encouraging for us because, you know, I'm sure later on today, Eddie's going to be thinking about how you went ten miles. Yeah. And he's going to be asking himself if Pam from Oklahoma could do it. I, I could do, do it, it too. too. So Pam, <laughs> thank you. We see you and appreciate mm -hmm. that. All right. Next one, Melissa. She said in the choose strong shopping group also she said my dad is choosing strong he will be 85 next month so uh kind of like the guy we met uh, this morning he has stage four cancer mm. and we go for a walk this morning his quote usual route and however at three miles an hour the whole day or the whole way sorry uh when we finish he says i'm still thinking i want to run again he has not felt well most of this year, but he is doing treatment now, and he still hopes to get back to running, though uh, through his cancer thing. So proud of him! So she has a little Strava walk with dad, two and a half miles, with uh, with her dad. So man, that's a what a cool memory for both of them, Melissa and her dad. Yeah, that is that's really sweet. I love that they they like to share being outside together, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we'll be thinking. Yeah. Me thinking of yep. So, yeah. Melissa, thanks for sharing that and letting everybody know in the group there. All mm -hmm. right. The last one I have is Brittany. And uh, in the Facebook group, she said, Rejoice. This weekend, I completed my second 100 miler oh, awesome. at the Tesla Hertz in Rocky Point, New York. I achieved my A goal of a sub 30 hour 100 miler. Implemented wow. lessons learned last time quicker aid stations, a dream, uh, dream team of crew and pacers. And I didn't sit down once. And I learn new ones for the next time. Tummy troubles, maybe don't eat pizza the night before, lol. I'm so proud of how this race went, how mentally strong we remained, and how we moved through discomfort because that's uh, how it was to get to the next high, which was true. Uh, one super fun moment, she goes on, she said around 100K, she saw uh, another runner with a Choose Strong hat, and she said, I'm listening to Sally Netty right now. And guess what? So was this other runner so uh she wanted to add that in so props to Brittany getting out there and running her second 100 mile in 30 hours which is mm. way impressive yeah, that's and amazing. uh she has a good picture of her holding her buckle up oh congratulations Brittany that's yeah. a, that's a really cool story and how special that you were able to share it with a a really awesome crew of people I think that's I know for me, my, my favorite races are always because of the people, the, the crew that was there with me. It's Pacer having Eddie out there. I mean, it's just uh, it, it, it becomes a core memory for you. You have a lot mm -hmm. of stories that come out of it and it's it's special for them, too. You know, I can't believe how many people that I've met in this sport. They got into the sport because either crew or paced a buddy. Yeah. You know, that they, they were road runners. Yeah. And they're like, wait a minute, I need to try this. Yeah. So um yeah, you you inspire people just by asking them to come out and, and enjoy the journey with you. But hundred miles is that is that is a big goal. Mm -hmm. That that takes a lot. It's it's it is commitment, it's it's belief. Um it's a a, a 
a big load on your body, really, yeah. like what you're putting it through, 100 miles uh, on your feet. Then you add up all the training that went into that and all the preparation, right? So um, I always, I, I love to celebrate that. It's, it's I, I giggle sometimes because I'll meet people like, yeah, you know, I'm not that fast but yeah i've done like 400s and i'm like this, this no we need to get rid of like it's only valid and you know as long as i did the 100 under 20 hours or uh I ran a marathon under three and a half hours it's no you're you're showing up you're putting in the work you're believing in uh this goal that you want to achieve and getting to that finish line that's that's the best part right there yeah and um that's what you're gonna remember the most like you're not it's very rare you're gonna remember those splits maybe for the the dream pr fastest time of 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 your life and something you might remember that but the things that sprout out about achieving that finish line in in running it's it's all the training that you put in it's the people that you shared that with it was the people that were cheering for you it was you know what you worked through when when it got really hard and uncomfortable and dark and and then that moment when you saw that finish line, putting the medal on you, it's like there's very valuable moments yeah. uh, that far outweigh the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I celebrate that. Sub 30 hours, it's fantastic. Yep. Props and, to Brittany. Yeah. And a shout out to everyone that is training for 100 right now. I think we have like uh, one or two. I think Rio de Lago is another like big one that's coming up. Um, I think there's a... 24 hour one that's coming up, but we we're really excited to see, um, people pushing toward, toward that big goal. I wanted to ask you a question because I, well, maybe it's because where I'm at now, I, I read the messages. I read, you know, stuff on Facebook, mm -hmm. Strava, and I, oh, I just see tons and tons of people completing hundred mile races, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Five, when you say tons, like I'm just hundreds. You you, you feel like the you you feel like it's common that you're seeing those. Yes. Yeah, so my mm -hmm. my question is: five years ago, I guess even mm -hmm. ten, but maybe more, just five years ago, was a hundred mile race like that popular as, as it is? I guess today, or is it the same? Or is it maybe I don't know. That's I don't know if that's no. I mean, it, it's the same for the two hundred. Even yeah. just five years ago, the two hundred was not nearly as pop as popular as it is. I mean, even this year, I feel like this year it exploded. Yeah. Um, and, and the sport as a whole has grown. I believe it's the, the sport of ultra running trail and ultra running is the fastest growing sport in, in the world. I've heard that quoted a few times, if not one of the fastest growing mm. sports. And, and you can actually see that because we're now going to events and we're, we are seeing a, uh, a bigger group of younger runners, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. we're seeing teens yeah. lining up at these uh, trail races, and we're 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 seeing uh, athletes who graduate from college and they're signing pro deals. Um, Ten years ago, that was very rare. I mean, you just didn't, yeah. you didn't see that. What you saw more often was uh, road athletes discovering trail and ultra mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and it was like oh like this is something new in addition to you know i've been a marathoner for 10 15 years i'm gonna go i'm gonna go try this um for those that were running you know at the elite level on the road um that was like another cool way to challenge yourself like try another distance go after that 50k um time but I think what we're seeing now is just the sport of being in the dirt and running mm -hmm. because there's a lot of very popular short races like 20 K's and 30 K's and, yeah. um, and there, you know, there's prize money at these things and there's lots of brands, you know, becoming involved. So what I've noticed is, um, an increase in the 100 mile distance as this big scary goal that people just want to try whether or not they've ever done an ultra uh, i've i've met multiple people who've never even done a marathon mm -hmm. and they're like i'm signing up for leadville hmm. and it's uh yeah so we're we're just kind of like seeing it as like this it's like this cool really hard thing yeah and 
which I think is good. I mean, I, I at the end of the day, my my belief has always been that our bodies are actually capable of far more than we think they are. And so when you have more and more people racing the hundred and it's like the vastness and uh, diversity of the people that are doing it. I mean, who is that like 16, 17 year old kid that did Coca Dona 250? Yeah, yeah. And his mom was whole in the race family, and his, yeah. like his whole family was in the race. That'd be really fun to have them on the podcast, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, that that sounds insane, mm-hmm. right? Like, like uh, you know, I, I could see that being a point of almost like controversy like 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. Who's letting this, this kid get on the start line and go 250 miles? And I just think, well, if if he has trained for it and his body is used, because I think his family like through hikes or something like okay, that. Okay, I don't know. But it's like, it's amazing what you train for. Yeah. You, know, you look at the story of Killian, for example. He grew up in the mountains, mm-hmm. these these long day treks with his mom and his sibling. And it's, it's pretty inspiring because it wasn't like he was raised in this rigid like training regimen. It's just like his his life as he knew it was climbing up mountains, yeah. being out in nature, and he he loved it. And I think when you do things and they are, as a child, they're rooted in these fun memories with your family and friends. And and you have all these, like, smiles, you know, the, these moments of joy that are associated with it. Um, that's like, that's, that is very powerful when you do embark it in it as a sport and it does get hard because it's rooted in love. Mm-hmm. Like you root it in like, dude, but I, I love being in the mountains. Like I know I can get through this and I have so many good memories. And, um, I've talked with Mackenzie about that before, you know, how like the cool thing about her being out in Flagstaff is she started running on trails Yeah, and we have so many like amazing stories, yep. you know? So what we're seeing is yes, a, a diversity of people getting out um, and trying the sport of trail and ultra. What I love especially is that we're seeing stories of people who have so many different backgrounds so like yeah I grew up playing tennis and like you hear of someone finishing a hundred you know I think sometimes we feel like well I didn't grow up running that's never been my my space and so like there's no way I would go run a hundred yeah right maybe I'll do a 10k or half marathon but like a hundred miles are you kidding me and I I love that we're seeing people from all over the place come and do a hundred miles yeah and, uh, and there's so many different types of courses too. So you could do a loop course, you could do it on a track, you could do it in the mountains, you could do a timed event. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can achieve the hundred miles mm-hmm. and, uh, it is growing. And so you, you do hear, uh, people doing it more and more. I see it also as a bucket list thing. Mm. You know, it's like the, it's skydiving. It's, uh, you know, I want to maybe a couple of the big prominent mountains that people are like, Oh, I want to, I want to get to the top of, of that mountain. I want to hike that, that mountain. I want to do this yeah. through hike. I think the hundred mile distance is starting to become something that in, in a similar way that you would, that you would view the marathon. I would love to run a marathon one day. A marathon is hard, mm-hmm. you know, road marathons are not easy and it isn't just something that you just go out and do and feel good about. Right. Yeah. It's there's, there's gotta be some training in there to, to feel good and finish across that that finish line, but I think the hundred, uh, more and more people feel like it's actually something they can do, because they're seeing all different ages and walks of life, like getting out there and doing it. And yeah. I, I love that. I'm, we see that in the two hundreds too. I mean, it, it's amazing. Like the the when I do the two hundred uh, distance, I get on the start line. I love looking around at the start line. It's so encouraging, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it's, it's wild when I look around, I'm like, wow, the, the, like that person's like 20 or 30 years older than me. Yeah. And, uh, and they crush it. Mm -hmm. Like they crush it. The, the further the distance. And for those of you that have maybe been thinking about embarking on that distance or it feels mysterious to you, um, the further you, you go, the more variables are involved in order to cross the finish line. So many variables, in fact, that um, 
running is a part of what you do. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like in the marathon, like you, you're running, like the goal is to run as best you can. Mm -hmm. Right. Even if you, if you follow the walk run method or whatever, but like the, you're not wearing a pack for the most part. I know some people do like they will, yeah. they'll carry their own water or their nutrition, but like, um, it is, it is not a, an essential piece of gear that you have to have. Mm -hmm. Um, you're not like nutrition isn't wildly complex. Like it, it gets more complex the further you go. Mm -hmm. Um, you're not out there as long. You're not working through day and night and different environments and different terrains. And so you're not actually required to have to be like so flexible and be a problem solver. Um, if you're pushing through a, a, a dark low spot in, in a marathon, it's not lasting hours and hours and hours. If you're in a 200, it can last hours and hours and hours of yeah. you moving very slow in an uncomfortable position. And so I think that's another piece of these longer distances is it kind of invites in a lot, a, a, a wider, broader range of people that have various strengths. Um, that's why I've said from the beginning, people who, who through hike, they're amazing at the 200s. Yeah. They're phenomenal. Mm -hmm. They're used to carrying 30, 40 pounds on their back. Yeah. And they, they got the nutrition down really good. True, yeah. They got the foot care down really good. And that's, that's huge. The foot care and the nutrition and the further you go, um, those two things can break your race. Those mm -hmm. two things can keep you from getting to, uh, the finish line are really making it painful to get to the finish line. So, um, you know, at, at, at the end of this, Ed, uh, I think that we would just love to see you be the person posting in the, no. in the choose strong community nope. with that registration screenshot happening. that says I have signed up for not Leadville. <laughs> Leadville. Yeah. Right. Actually, I would love to see you sign up for Havelina because it's, it's five loops. You do a 20 mile loop, you come back in and it is a party. We just saw Havelina just finish up this past weekend. It was so, it's always so exciting to watch that. It's wild. I think it you, is wild. I, you pull it open and you're like, okay, I, this is weird. I saw a couple pictures. I'm like, this is not for me. It's, it's a little wild. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, there's like a couple posts that you're like, this this is kind of weird, Sally. And I was like, yeah, it can be kind of weird. I think one of the aid stations, like, I think the volunteers at some point don't wear very many clothes. Like, there's like the lights and music, and uh, yeah, it can get a, a little wild. But it's it's all like based on Halloween. Yeah, you know, it's supposed to be like a, a wild party in the desert, and so. Yeah, um, maybe I'll sign up and be uh, bring back my uh, costume of uh, being a beat up soccer player. <laughs> See what happens. I would See love what it. What happens? I'd love it. I've I've been out there once. I ran it in 2019, and I had the best time. Yeah. it was so fun. It does look like but, a lot of fun. Um, it is true though that it's uh, you get that one uh, the giant aid station. It's 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 where you complete the loop. It's the start. It's the finish. That's the one time you see your crew. Mm -hmm. But it's like the sirens. Like you Women. come in. It's like uh, you know. It's you want to stay. If you're in a mm. low point and you come in there and you see that there's food trucks and music there's and energy people, there, right? There's like everybody's energy like loud and everyone's having fun. And, yeah. You're like, I kind of just want to like hang out and like be part of this party. I don't want to go back out into the desert and run another Wait, 20 miles. Wait, that's the only place the crew can that's see? That's the only, yeah, that's why it's so f great. Oh, I'll, I'll crew you then. That's like why well, it's so great because because and... you can also, um, you know, you can bring in maybe family and friends that wouldn't yeah. normally want to be out in the mountains crewing, right? And so they get to experience like, it's so fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's great. It's, it's a good time every single year. It's really fun to see. Um, and it's fast running. I mean, if you, yeah. if you want to post a good time, it is a deceitful course though. Cause I think, uh, in years past, I know even before that I did it, I thought it was a, like a flat fast course, but it's not, mm. um, there's only like between 10 and 11,000 feet of climbing, but just how it's situated. Mm. And then there's, it, there's lots of rocks and, and it's hard. It was the only race I've ever done in my whole life where the bottom of my feet felt like I was like, dude, I just feel like I'm, I'm running on like, like just hard metal, mm. you know? And, um, but it was a fun, a really, a really fun race. Fun times. And, uh, yeah. All right. Well, we'll see. Well, I don't know. We'll Ed, see. That would be a good first hundred for you. I don't know.
Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on real quick. And uh, why don't yeah. you get into your story, Sal, that you're going to share with mm-hmm. us. Yeah. And uh, let's dive right into that. This story, Eddie, takes place six years before I met you. Hmm. So I was not in the picture. You weren't in the picture. I was All 12 right. years old. Yep. I did uh, not know you then. Yeah. 11, 12. I think, I think when I started this conversation with my mom, I, I may have been 11 going into 12. All right. So I was in middle school. Mm-hmm. And the the story is is actually featured in my book okay and it's titled gymnastics and i i purposely put this story in there because i really do think it it laid a foundation in my mind where i understood in in the most like tangible way one what it meant to work for something as a kid, Mm -hmm. you know, as a kid, like what it really meant to work hard. And it wasn't in school. It wasn't, you know, doing my best on my vocabulary test or, you know, studying my math problems. Um, This was in my mind, me going after a dream in my head. And I've shared this before. I always had wild and crazy dreams as a kid. So I really believed in, in previous years, so like probably like around like seven or eight years old, I told my mom that I, I wanted to be a gymnast. I wanted to go to the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And we lived uh, in an area that had um, like a recreational gymnastics class. And me and my sister were in that. And I don't know if it was a free class or... If it was, I know what you're thinking of right now. <laughs> sorry. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Should I find that video? <laughs> no, no. I should find I'm it so sorry. that people can see how terrible how you know? it actually was. No, how did you know I was Cause thinking of I, that? Because I love you. Oh my gosh. And all I have to do I'm is sorry. look at you and I know what you're <laughs> talking sorry. about. Okay, for those of you that are like running along and you're like, why is Eddie <laughs> suddenly laughing? There is a video of me and my sister, my older sister, when we were in gymnastics class together. So, um, as I was saying, we were in this recreation class, but Mm -hmm. it wasn't a real gymnastics facility. It was in a gym. Yeah. And and like like a like a bas it was on a basketball court. Right. The local public basketball court. City court, yeah. City court. Um, that's where I learned gymnastics. And and uh, Nanja was my teacher, and she would pull out this thin blue mat. And um, and there was a couple balance beams, so they would set up the equipment before before the classes. So there was two sets of bars. There was a couple of balance beams. There was a vault, mm-hmm. and there was a floor area. But, you know, we didn't have spring floors and, and things like that. So we had these all, – all the equipment, and – um, my sister and I were naturally, we were very little, like I didn't, I didn't actually, uh, like really grow until I was a junior in high school. I think I started my freshman year. I was like four foot eight, four foot nine. I was, I was, I was small. I wasn't even 90 pounds. Mm-hmm. And, um, so gymnastics, uh, we were a good fit for that. And our, our, our coach Nanja would tell us that, you know, and, um, Janelle and I, uh, my sister and I, we, we were, we were strong and, um, and she, she, man, my sister, she was good at like flipping and she could do the splits one way and I could do the splits the other way, but we both couldn't do it, which way the other one could do it. And, uh, we love competing with each other and she and I are only 13 months apart. But, um, this video that Eddie is laughing about, it's a home video that my mom took of Janelle and I, uh, standing next to the uneven bars with our coach and she's trying to explain something to the class now um janelle in my opinion was the best one in the class Mm. and uh and she could do like she she could do backflips like all in a row and but i was always like trying to compete with her and not just sometimes you know the the teacher would would call on us sometimes to demonstrate something she called on 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 my sister to demonstrate quite a bit and um (laughs) the video shows me trying to do what the what coach nanja asked us to do and i i i don't even know what the skill is (laughs) but i'm basically holding on to the lower bar with my feet (laughs) feet on the bar and I'm trying to get momentum and swing, and I don't. <laughs> I'm just hanging there. 
I'm hanging there with my hang, by my hands with both my feet on the outside of my hands. And then all of a sudden you just see me drop. <laughs> you see me just drop out of the screen. And the coach starts laughing. And then Janelle starts laughing at me like, oh, my gosh. How pathetic. <laughs> like, like you're so pathetic. <laughs> but then the, it gets better because then Janelle goes to do it. <laughs> And she goes like, she does part of it, but then goes flying out of the picture. Yeah. And Coach Nanja was just like, oh my gosh, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Like, did both of you did not execute the skill at all. And it was just like, but it was so, it's so pure. Yeah. It's so just like, I, I think she and I were like eight and nine years old. Yeah. And um, typical sibling rivalry, us wanting to outdo one another. And I go up first to try to do this skill. I completely fail. And then Janelle's like, well, let me show you. <laughs> she fails. And the coach is standing there like, okay. <laughs> so anyway, uh, despite despite that, like uh, we we skipped levels in gymnastics. So so Janelle and I, we would in, you know, we would improve on the skills and we got to skip a class. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, man, I'm just I'm getting really good. And, you know, when you're a little kid, you don't you don't understand the cost of classes and lessons and uh, time commitment. You also definitely don't understand the commitment level that it takes for your parents when when a kid signs up for a sport, especially when you have several siblings. Yeah. uh, What that means. And, you know, gymnastics today is uh, it's a it's a big time commitment if you want to. If you if you want to go to the Olympics, yeah. it's like oh, yeah. most of those kids are homeschooled, and they're they're training you know six to seven hours a day. They're they're training six to seven days a week. Um, there's a big commitment, and it's uh, by no means an inexpensive sport. Mm-hmm. It, it's an expensive sport, especially because you're training that much, right? Yeah. And it's the skills that you're you're learning. They're very specialized, and so you. On one hand, you really want to make sure you have a good coach that that knows what they're what they're doing. I mean, you have these little bodies that are flipping all over the place, mm-hmm. right? And some of these skills uh, on a certain level are pretty dangerous. So this isn't like your local rec league of just signing up and playing soccer. Um, it's a specialized technical sport that requires a lot of commitment to get good at. But As I was saying before, when you're a kid, you don't think of any of that. You just watch Olympics on TV and you have these heroes and you say, I want to be Mary Lou Retton. I want to be Shannon Miller. I want to, I want to go to the Olympics. That sounds amazing. And, um, so anyway, we moved and we, we stopped going to coach Nanja. We moved when I was 10 and I really loved gymnastics. I was starting to get good. I think I had just learned how to do a back tuck. Um, I think we'd been training to do like a flip on the balance beam. And I was like, big deal, you know? Mm-hmm. It, was a, it was a good skill. And when we moved away, we moved like over an hour away, inland, away from the coast. Uh, I remember going to my mom probably like around the time I was like 11. So like a year passed and I was like, I really miss gymnastics and I I really want to get back into it. And, you know, I would, I would flip around at home in the living room and still do the splits. And I loved doing that. And I was the kid at recess that would like to do the flips on the grass. And, uh, yeah, I just found a lot of joy in it. And so I, I asked my mom if she could sign me up for a gymnastics class. And she came back to me and said, you know, I've called around. And, and I, I, I remember stating to her, but mom, I want to go to a real gymnastics class. I don't want to go to a basketball court yeah. that pulls out a beam and, and a flat blue mat. And so my mom called around at some places and she was just straight up honest and said, these, you know, it's $160 a month. Now, that's a lot of money. Especially back way back then, especially 30 years ago, that was a lot of money. And to a kid, that's a lot of money. And I remember when she said that and I just thought, well, that's an impossible amount because by this time in my life, too, you know, we had seven people in my family and, uh, you know, we 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 had what we needed growing up. But, you know, we we struggled in 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 certain areas and as we struggled to pay the bills sometimes and, you know, we didn't have medical and, and dental care and, and things like that. But 
um, you know, the extras were, especially at that price range, I knew by the time I was 12 years old that, yeah, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I complained. I complained as, as most kids do, you know, as the typical, it's not fair. Mm. Mom, it's not fair that, you know, my friends who are rich, you know, I always thought that just because I had friends that had more than me, that just meant they were rich, yeah. you know? So mm. I thought everyone around me was rich, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, so I remember saying that to her. It, it's just not fair that I can't do what I love because uh, we don't have the money. And thankfully, I had a mom that said, well, you can, you can work for it. You actually can do what you want to do, but you need to earn it. Mm -hmm. And so at this time, at, at 12 years old, uh, my older sister and I, we had actually uh, – Picked up a few babysitting jobs in the neighborhood. We lived in a neighborhood with lo there was lots of families, lots of young families all around. And this was still at the time too when you'd walk outside, you'd see kids everywhere, and you know, kids kind of spent a lot of time out outside. And so you, you got to know your neighbors, and you got to interact with your friends, younger siblings, and and everything. So Janelle and I started picking up, um, you know, babysitting jobs and. And I was like, wow, this is a cool way to, to make some cash. And so my mom encouraged me, why don't you put up signs around the neighborhood? And these were like those, you know, do you remember those signs that you'd see on, on mailboxes? Well, we had like the community mailbox. Um, it's a piece of paper. You get a Sharpie. You know, call me for babysitting. And you just tear off the little tab. Mm -hmm, yeah. You know, you like cut the paper at the bottom and you just yeah. care off. The, you tear off the tab with the phone number. And so that's what I did. I flyered the neighborhood. I made a sign saying that my babysitting services were available. And I think back then it was just kind of like a one lump sum. You know, you, you show up at someone's house and they're like, I'll give you 20 bucks. Yeah. You know, I'll give you 20 bucks. Babysit my three kids. We're going to be gone for four or five hours. And uh, you'll get that, that $20 bill when we get back. And so that's what I did. I... I thought, well, if I really want to do this gymnastics class, then I'm going to have to put some work in. And then I, I, so I started doing that and the weeks passed. And I remember I have a conversation with my mom one night and she's like, you know, if you, if you want to get more jobs, just be the best babysitter that's out there. And she gave me this idea that, you know, one of the things that moms really like is when they come home and the kitchen is clean mm -hmm. or, you know, you put the kids to bed, you know, maybe you, uh, help you know you made dinner you fed the kids they like those are all like bonuses oh yeah and and parents start talking when they get a babysitter who's who's doing a little extra so that's what i did i was like i i'm going to be the best babysitter in the neighborhood and i'm going to start doing a little extra so i was doing laundry i was making dinner i would i would make sure the dishes were done and the counters were wiped down i would find the vacuum and vacuum the carpet and um and I got lots of babysitting jobs. In fact, that was one of the jobs that I did from age 12 to 16. Um, even as I picked up uh, other jobs, I yeah, was... I bet those moms loved Loved you. me. They're like, wow, so yeah. I come in and clean my house. Yes. Do the dishes and wash my kids? Yeah. That's the best I, $20 I, of my life right here. Right? So a few months passed, and I was so proud when I saved up enough money to pay for a couple months of gymnastics class. Mm -hmm. And I remember that first time driving down the freeway. It was like a 20, 25-minute drive. It was a few cities over. Mm -hmm. That first time, and what I – it was just me and mom in the car, and we arrive at this gymnastics facility, and I, re I remember walking in and the smell, a certain smell that, that gyms have. And uh, there, there's a, a, a lobby area and there's like a, a desk, like an office where the staff is. But then there's windows that look out into the facility. And I just remember it was it was magical. Hmm. It was like everything that I had, had envisioned and even better. It was and I, I could see so many uh gymnasts you know they're flipping they're doing flips on the on the beam and they're they're going on the vault and there's like the pit and there's the high bar and there's it, it was 
it was amazing. I'd never been in that situation before. I'd never been so up close to, uh, you know, what I'd always envisioned in my head. Yeah. I, I wanted to be in a facility like that. I wanted like the real coaching and that opportunity to compete on a team. And I felt like we have arrived. And one of the coaches came out. They knew that we were coming. Part of the process is what level of a class are you going to be in? So there's like a developmental level, which is like you're not competing yet. So you're like kind of developing, you have some skills down. Uh, and then as, as you master all those skills, you can move up to the next level. I don't know if the levels are still the same as, as what they were when I was a kid, but usually level five um, is when you start competing, or at least it's like the introduction to competing. And then there's six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and, and it goes beyond that. And if you're like level nine, ten, like you are amazing, mm. you know, you're, you're probably going to college or to the Olympics, you know, you're one of the best. And, um, I got really nervous because I knew that this coach was going to test my skills. And I remember just looking at my mom and between every single, uh, skill and just uh, my hands are sweating and I'm just, I'm putting all this pressure on myself and I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to fail and they're not going to let me, mm -hmm. they're not going to let me in. And, um, you know, and it's really basic stuff. It was, you know, pop up into a handstand and they're looking at your form and how long you hold it. And they're looking at your arms and are you tucking in your hips and, um, let's see your splits, you know, both ways, all, well, all three ways. And, um, you know, let's see the, the back bend and the back walk over and they're looking at your flexibility and, and, you know, just really the, the foundational pieces. And she then leaves and I'm sitting, I'm sitting next to my mom on the, on the chair and I'm so nervous. And I remember just kind of looking up at her and being like, oh man, I didn't do good. And, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not good enough. And she's like, stop, you know, like, let's just wait for her to come back. Like you did mm -hmm. great. You're fine. And, um, the, the coach comes out and she's like, you know, she said, Sally, you did, you did, you did a good job. And I, I think you'd be, we know you want to compete and we think that you would be a good fit for the developmental level. So was not good enough at 12 mm -hmm. to even be competing on the, at the lowest level. Mm -hmm. I was, I was below that. And this, this part of the story is really important because there's, I think there's two things that need to happen that we need to figure out on our own sometimes without, without somebody telling us, you know, I think it's really easy to listen just to critics. It's le easy. Um, you know, and, and some of us have grown up in like in a, in a negative environment where you're like, yeah, I was always told I couldn't do anything or, or someone's always playing like the logical one and it's just like well logically you can't do that yeah. you know it's just not possible and I think that when I told my mom I wanted to go to the Olympics and that I wanted to sign up for real gymnastics classes and here I'm 11 12 years old I think that logically she knew one <laughs> there's no way that we can afford it there's no way that I, we even have like the capacity to drive you back and forth six to seven days a week six to seven hours a day like we <laughs> you're, what, if, what if she pulled you aside and says you know what Sal <laughs> check out this video I have of you I don't know if this is the right the right path that she shows she shows don't. me the one of me falling off the bar just oh, hanging there I don't know if this is the right lifeless <laughs> yeah and and this is this is like the piece that if you are a coach if you are a teacher if you are a parent if you are a friend trying to encourage somebody else we don't necessarily need to hang on to what this person's end goal is yeah and that's where we get stuck that's where we always set ourselves up short. That's where we come up short with our goals, um, is obsessing so much on that's the goal I want. And if I don't reach it exactly in the way that I envision it, then I'm, I'm a failure. And anything that I did before that was a waste of time. And, and I failed. Mm -hmm. And we can beat ourselves up in that journey to not achieving what we wanted to. We can also never even try because we look at what the goal is and we think, well, I don't fit that. And in my position, I was too old. I mean, by, by when you look at the path of a lot of these gymnasts that go to the Olympics, I mean, they're doing backflips on the G on the beam at like four mm. and five years old, yeah. right? That doesn't mean though. Okay. 
that that doesn't mean that you still can't achieve that dream. And I, I would suffice it to say also that every Olympic gymnast didn't have the exact same path. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some kids that were in natural and they didn't discover it until they're eight or nine yeah. or maybe 10 years old. You know, these these natural gifts and talents that we are that we are all given you know, you were talking about how does someone know they're an opera singer? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I look at, at ballerinas and people who can ice skate and even like tennis players and the, or basketball players. Like some of like the technique and the athleticism that's just woven into them. Mm -hmm. And it's it's beautiful. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, but the the lesson in here was was no, I was not meant to be an Olympic gymnast. But the beautiful thing about this me trying, it laid the foundation for how I continue to do everything in my life, even today. Mm. Because as I walked out into that gym, and again, now remember what I said, I was little. I yeah. actually was very little for a 12 year old. Mm -hmm. No one ever, ever thought I was 12. No one ever thought that when I, Janelle and my, my older sister and I both, no one ever thought that Janelle and I were in middle school. Um, I don't know if, if these are still the same types of sizes in clothing, but she and I, if any, if anyone listening remembers the size six X, I remember the size six X so well, cause she and I wore it for several years, uh, even into our middle school years. So, um, it was, a, it was a small size. We were just, we just grew later on in, in life. And so when I walked out, I'm thinking in my mind that I'm small cause everybody knew me as small. Mm -hmm. Um, people like to pick me up for fun. Uh, I was always referred, you know, I was always the shortest one in the class picture, um, you know, at, at school or on the soccer team. And so in my mind, I'm thinking I can do backflips. I'm small. I'm, pr I, I skipped, I skipped levels in my, in my rec gymnastics class. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be good. Well, to my surprise, when I got into a real legit facility and I'm, I'm walking out now with my mom, the coach is like, let's go meet your team. So we pass one team and everyone, all the different levels are working out at different apparatuses throughout the gym. There's some on the floor and I'm watching in awe. The floor was my favorite. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching girls that look no older than eight years old doing things that I could only dream about, mm -hmm. you know, just flipping just so much power and speed. Uh, uh, across the floor the the tricks they were doing were amazing and I was like wow they're definitely younger than me and they're already doing that and then I look over at the beam and it's kind of the same thing girls that in in my opinion like well those girls are younger than me and they're smaller than me and they're doing way harder tricks than I than I know how to do I then start to get kind of nervous because I'm starting to compare myself in a way that I've never compared myself ever in my life. Because I grew up like I was always little. And, you know, at, at recess when I would do flips, like it was super cool. Not a lot of people could do flips. Mm -hmm. When I showed up to my group, not only was I embarrassed because everyone on the team was younger than me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's probably like six-year-olds. Uh the oldest girl was maybe 10 and I'm 12 at this time. And when I walk up, all, all the kids look up to me and just as little kids do. What if they're like, Oh, there's my babysitter. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's the other thing too. I'm looking at some of these kids. I'm like, I literally babysit kids this age. <laughs> and uh, my face is red. And the, the coach that had walked me up is now introducing me to who's going to be my coach. And, uh, it was the end of their session, so I wasn't training with them that night. Hey, you guys, this is Sally. She's going to be joining you on the developmental program, and she's very excited to be here. And a couple of the younger ones look up at me, and they're like, you're big. <laughs> Just straight up, you are big. Uh, and then other voices start to come through, and how old are you? What school do you go to? Most of the faces were confused as to why I was there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I smiled and introduced myself. I knew it'd only be there for a couple minutes. And I'm telling my, I'm so embarrassed and, uh, say hello, introduce myself to the coach. And then, uh, it was time for them to clean up the, the equipment. And so they all, they all kind of run away. And 
Um, and then me and my mom leave. We we get in the car, and I oh, I was I was so disappointed. And I I even I I remember looking out of the window and being so confused about how to feel mm. because when I reflected on how hard I had worked just so I could have the chance to walk in that door, just so I could have the chance to possibly pursue this big, crazy, childish dream that I had in my hand, in my head. And I, I thought I was good, you know? I thought that this would be something uh, that would bring me joy and now I just felt dumb. Now I just felt silly. Mm. And I didn't, you know, as a kid, you just, you, it's, it was a lot to take in. Like, how am I supposed to feel about this? Because I, I worked really hard and I just, as kid, you think that I, I work hard for something, it's, it's going to turn out the way that I hoped it to be because mm -hmm. that's what mom and dad have always told me. Like, you work hard, it pays off. Hard work pays off. It doesn't always pay off in the way that you think it will. But work does pay off in ways that maybe you didn't expect. And it does pay off maybe a little bit further down the road than you wanted it to. And as the story goes, I continued going to gymnastics class for only three or four months. And I did get better. I learned that I wasn't as good as I thought I was. And I learned that there was a lot of work ahead of me even if I just wanted to compete on the team, which after those, after the first uh, couple months, I learned the skills in order to make it into the next level. So um, when we were given, and this is a big deal, when you graduate and now you're on the competitive team, so it's just the very first level of the competitive team, you get to have the team uniform. And there was a picture day, and so, you know, after those two months of three days a week and my mom driving just me, um, you know, I'm starting to learn a couple things. I'm starting to learn about the commitment that my mom's making. I'm learning that I, and I made those payments every time it was time to pay each month. I had to give that cash to my mom and I knew I was paying for those lessons. I was really proud of that. And I also learned that it was a lot of hard work and I was not at all the best one on the team. And when I was told that, hey, Sally, you've, you've mastered the skills necessary in order to go to the entry level competition team, that was just like the greatest, you know, the greatest day for me. This is one of the best parts of, you know, of all of this. And I go and I, 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 I put on that official team leotard. I need to find the picture. This is like the one like official mm -hmm. look of me as a gymnast. And, um, and we went out. And we all took a picture. Remember, we I, I ordered those pictures. I really wanted that picture. When we were done taking pictures, we they gathered us up and they said, you know, now that you are uh, on the competitive team, we need you to start taking an additional class. And that is a dance class. And that dance class will be, I think it was like f an additional $50 or $60 a month. Mm -hmm. And... As soon as I heard that it was going to be an additional fifty or sixty dollars a month, my heart just dropped. See that 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 money uh, felt very heavy, and I remember feeling so isolated as I stood there with all the other girls, and knowing that that wasn't something that any of those my teammates were worrying about, mm. but it was something that I worried about, and. I already felt like I was babysitting a lot and, you know, I got back in the car and, and kind of the same thing, you know, here it is three, four months later and I'm, I'm talking to mom and I'm just telling her like, I don't know if I can, if I can afford that. That's a lot of money a month. And also realizing this probably isn't the sport for me. Mm. You know, this probably isn't like, maybe I didn't love it as much. Maybe this isn't like the path for me. Um, you know, I had, I had played recreational soccer. I was pretty good at recreational soccer. Uh, you know, had a little, a few doubts in my mind even about that because after my gymnastics experience, me thinking I'm so good at gymnastics mm -hmm. and now this is how it's turning out. But 
I decided I had to make that decision. If I was going to go back, I needed to come up with that money um, or I was going to be done. And, and I made that decision on my own because it was kind of the same conversation. You know, mom, mom was like, yeah, you can, you can sign up for it. You did it before. And it's really what you want to work for. You know, what do you want to work for? And so I made that decision that I, I think I'm done with gymnastics. And I, I cried for months. I cried for months and months over that decision because I loved it. Mm -hmm. I really found joy in flipping across the floor. I loved the concentration and the focus that came with being on the beam. And now it was, it was over. And, you know, is in, in any way that a, a kid would interact with a broken dream or something not coming to fruition, what I felt like I was, I was sitting with was, man, I, I just worked so hard and it felt like it came to nothing. Well, a few months later, uh, was the talent show and I decided to enter and I came up with a gymnastics routine. I came up with this, uh, I think I, I did it to a Beauty and the Beast song, nice. a song from the movie, mm -hmm. but it was just the instrumental. And for weeks I would practice. I would run down the hallway in my house and I would, I would do some flips in, in the living room and um, practice the little dancing pieces in, in between. And, and my mom would cheer and, and, you know, she'd watch me. And, and then it came time to perform in front of the whole school. And I ended up winning first place. <laughs> So I got first place in the talent show for my gymnastics routine. That was the last time and really the only time I performed a gymnastics routine in public. Hmm. And to this day, when I look back on that, it's, it's one of my favorite, most special accomplishments, you know, of, of my youth because it, it marked a very important lesson for me that I, as I said earlier, like I've, I've carried that with me for the rest of my life. The initial goal was, Mom, I want to go to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. It was pie in the sky, shoot super high, because that's what you do when you're a kid. Mm -hmm. Like, you're curious, you're full of wonder. You know, you don't put life and dreams on the same scale that you do when you're an adult. You're not as jaded, you know, and, and you don't have as many critics. And God bless the kids of today because, man, the critics just – I mean, thank you, social media, for just allowing every everyone that has an account to have lots of critics, mm -hmm. right? Um, back then, like, the, the critics were in your inner circle. Yeah. And the mean kids at school, right? Or maybe a mean teacher. Um, so – it was, it was easy for me to, to dream those big things because the things that I learned about or the things that I wanted to do, a lot of times because I saw it in a movie or saw it on TV or I, you know, there was a, a speaker that came to the school and like they had this really cool story about what they do for a living. It's like, I want to try that. And, and you learn it from books. And, and I think that after winning that, the, the talent show, I, I, I got a $50 check. Mm -hmm. and that, was, that was a really big deal. I got that $50 check, but um, I learned some key things. I learned that when you really want something, when you have a, a goal or a dream, it is th th there is a way, and, and typically comes just from good old-fashioned hard work. If you want something, work for it, and that will never change. I know there's this, uh, you know, some of us get handouts and opportunities and things fall into our lap and sometimes we get lucky and there's just the blessing and things are passed down and some of us come from money and it's like who you know. But at the end of the day, we all have the ability to work. We all have the ability to try. And I think in my situation, it wasn't just, hey, we have this extra money. Um, you know, sure, whatever class you want to sign up for, go ahead. But my mom taught me that instead of sitting here and complaining about what you don't have, go and work. Go make your money. And so I got to feel and experience what it meant to make my own money, what it meant to pay for something myself, and to really work in such a way that allowed me to achieve stepping into a gymnastics building and getting that coaching. I did not achieve most of the things that were in my head as it related to gymnastics. 
but the work ethic and uh, even within each class, uh, what I learned about that, like it was, it was humbling for me. It was humbling to understand one that I was seen as too old, too big to be on that team. I didn't fit in. Hmm. And, and that taught me a lot too, because um, interesting enough, just a year later when I went to high school and I tried out for, and I was still playing AYSO recreational soccer, we couldn't afford a club team. But when I tried out for the high school team, I really believed that I could make the varsity team. And I remember distinctly coming to tryouts and girls looking at me and telling me I was too little. Hmm. You're too small. Now I ended up making the varsity team and being the top scorer. Uh, on the team and a scout from a club team came a uh, local club team and gave me a scholarship to play on a club team and it was like all of this is uh learning opportunities for me because I didn't maybe fit the part or I didn't have the resources it really would have been easy for me to lean into those things and see 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 so I, I this is just the way it is and I'm going to play a victim because my I'm I'm too big in this as a gymnast, I'm too small as a soccer player. I don't have the funds to sign up for this class or to get this trainer. And so like, I need just to go find something else to do. But what my mom taught me was like, well, you can also try. You can also work and make your own money and just see where that takes you. And when I finally arrived at the class, it was like, yeah, you've, you just discovered that you have a lot of work to do in order to accomplish these skills to move up to the next level. What are you willing to do? And this is actually what the real training looks like. This is the commitment that you need to make. And are you going to make that or not? And I wanted to tell this story today because we get messages Eddie, we get to read a lot of posts about people that are working toward goals. And this mm -hmm. isn't just in running. We, I know I have a lot of people running right now that are trying to meet a goal, whether it's a fitness goal or a race goal. But in life, we are able to work towards things that we have either dreamed about or even as it pertains to just a, a career or getting to college. And too often, we sit back when things don't turn out the way that we want them to, and we think that that work was meant for nothing. It would have been really easy for me to think that, wow, I, I totally failed. That was a really bad idea. But what if all the work that you're doing right now, if you don't reach that goal, if you don't achieve uh, the, the dream in the way that you wanted it to, can you look back and see all the things that you did achieve? What is the gold in the journey? What are the lessons? What is the growth? What can you take with you to use further down the road? Now, I'll tell you what, what I learned in that year as a 12-year-old girl on how to work, how to make my own money, how to believe, how to end handle setbacks, failures, and being humbled in, hey, you need to work a little harder. This is the work required of you. And I have used that my whole life, but it's essentially what got me to where I am today because I just keep on applying that. I can set a goal for myself, and I'm okay if it actually doesn't turn out the way that I dreamed it to be because I don't think that my work is in vain because it just might – take me somewhere else and this is even what happened in soccer you know I, I did achieve the dream of going and playing college soccer my my bigger goal after I left in Maxis was like well I want to be a professional soccer player that did not happen I never even knew about ultra running and trail running and so it's just it, it's it's uh it's important that we look at our story and we look at how far we've come and that we look at every loss or failure or disappointment and what came before that. What was the work that you did before that? What were you doing? What were the steps? Because the setback or when you miss that mark, it's one showcasing that you were trying. You were building towards something. But anytime you have a setback or a failure and then you wake up the next day, it means that there's, you're supposed to get up and do it again. You're supposed to get up and keep trying. You're supposed to 
keep going. And you're not going to know what's down the road or what's waiting for you, what the next opportunity is, unless you get up and keep going. And none of us know what is, what is waiting down the road. And the only way you're going to find out is by moving forward. So I love the gymnastics story. It's a, it's a story for, uh, for young and old alike. Because what I know to be true is that now here I am, uh, 33 years later, and I still get to work toward crazy dreams in my head. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that I think up or dream about or I want to do or that I pursue, most of those things don't happen. But what's really cool is it only takes a couple things that keep me moving forward. And, and a lot of times when I'm, I'm working towards one thing, I discover that there's something better waiting. And that's pretty fun. Yeah, that's a powerful, powerful story. Building blocks and keep moving forward and showing up, doing the work. I mm -hmm. think that's encouraging mm -hmm. for uh, everybody out there putting in that work and not knowing what's, what's next. Keep doing the work, friends. If you are uh, running right now, lifting, doing some laundry, listen, we, uh, Eddie and I are doing the work right alongside you. In fact, let's be honest, Ed, right before we started this, I said, are you a little stressed right now? And he said, yeah, because <laughs> I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> How relatable is that? So uh, listen, we, we are in the grind right there with you day in and day out. You know, we, we really appreciate uh, you as our listener. Yes. And uh, that you've chosen our podcast today. Um you know, we always hope that there's there's a point of contact where we, we get to meet some of you mm -hmm. in person, at an event, at a race, somewhere. But um, if there's anything that we are going to continue to remind you of is, is one, you are, you are valuable, you are loved, you have a lot of purpose um, in your life. Every day you wake up, there, there's, there's a reason for that. And uh, Eddie, we were kind of chatting over, over coffee today. I said, you know, one of the things that I, I know is going on in our world right now is, uh, well, in, in the United States is we're about to uh, um, vote, mm -hmm. you know? And we do not consider this a political uh, podcast. We actually love that, that we're not <laughs> because we want people to have a break from that. I think that um, we've been pounded with, with, politics uh as soon as you turn on your tv on the radio there's a lot of accounts on on uh, social media um a lot of other podcasts where you can consume all that so we know there's a lot of other places where you can consume that and we like to give you a break from that mm -hmm. we like to invite you in to our living room uh as as our friend and just love and and, and encourage you and um, we hope that however the next few months unfold for you um, in whatever goal you're working toward is we, it really it's because we're entering the, the end of this year. Yeah. Gosh, is it only a couple months? It's Ooh. coming quick. Yeah. So I guess however the, the last two months of the year, however that unfolds for you. So if you are uh, finishing up your racing season, um, maybe you're welcoming family in for the holidays. Maybe you're traveling. Maybe you got a big project that you got to finish at work. Or for those of you that are going to be taking finals, we have a lot of college mm -hmm. kids that listen to this uh, this podcast. Yeah. However these next uh, few months are looking for you, however they unfold, we hope that you keep on tuning into the Choose Strong podcast because um, we're always going to take a minute to encourage you and to remind you to keep choosing strong in all you do. Mm -hmm.